Jo and I'm from the COBRE. Um, before we start, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about the COBRE and then I will hand it over to Lee. Um, so this continuing education course is hosted by the Center of Biomedical Research Excellence on Opioids and Overdose, the first center of its kind that addresses the opioid epidemic. The center brings together leaders from institutions across Rhode Island to support the research needed to combat the opioid epidemic that is hampering and taking the lives of our friends and neighbors. To learn more about the work we're doing, please go to our website, www.opioidcobray.org. All right, and over to you, Lee. Wonderful, thank you, Joe. Um, thank you so much, all of you, for joining me today to learn about harm reduction and other topics that are within its orbit. I'm Lee Hubbard, I'm a registered nurse. I've worked in inpatient care, acute care, critical care, surgery, um, ambulatory care, women's medicine and reproductive care. I currently am the program manager for the Total Joint Center at the Miriam Hospital and clinical manager of pre-admission testing. Care patients who use drugs and opioids and who have suffered from opioid overdose and the support of nurses with opioid use disorder are all topics that I care deeply about and that I spend much of my free time learning about and thinking about um, and talking about with, with other people in this field. I also am the chair of the Government Affairs Committee of um, the American Nurses Association, the Rhode Island chapter. I was just appointed president uh, for a one-year term. And uh, through those positions, I also advocate for ongoing support of persons who use drugs, have opioid use disorder, or who have ended up needing medical care because of their opioid use. At this point, I'm gonna turn off my video so that you can pay attention to the slides. Um, again, thank you for joining us. Uh, Joe, you can go next. I do not have any relevant financial considerations to disclose. So here we go. I want you to sit back and, and think about this scenario. Uh, one of your patients is being treated for burns. The patient states that he doesn't know how this happened. He states that he's homeless. He had a campfire going and prior talk screens when you look through the record have been positive for opiates. Um, this patient's requesting pain medication. Uh, more frequently than it's currently ordered. What emotions does this scenario generate? Next. Next slide. Why do you feel or think the way you do about this particular patient? I want you to consider the following. How long ago did you complete your associates or your bachelor's degree, your, your formal professional training? How long have you specialized in your current field of nursing? And of late, what has the focus of drug-related and opioid-related educational offerings been? In your place of work, what sort of policies exist and how does that relate to drug use or opioid use? How do current policies where you work affect how you're able to treat patients um, who use drugs or have opioid use disorder? How many of these patients do you see each day or each week or each month that have opioid use in their past? What about you? How does your substance use influence how you care for your patients? How have your personal, private experiences with substance use influenced your perception of persons who use drugs? How close to home does all of this hit for you? I've had four friends from college who have passed away from opioid-related overdoses or situations related to their drug use. I know and have worked with two nurses who have lost their licenses because of opioid use. I know many more who maybe use substances in ways that do not affect their lives in any sort of negative way. All of this impacts how I care for patients. Finally, what experiences have you had with your patients who offered truthful information about their drug use? What about patients who offered deceptive information? How did these re revelations or secrets 
influence your behavior, your perspective, and how you cared for your patients. We're gonna watch a brief video now. Uh, we might not be um, ha seeming to have technicalty, technical difficulty. I'm not sure why it's not playing. Um, so I'm very sorry, Lee, but I don't think we'll be able to play this one. We can send it out to people. We can send the link out to people. That um, would be great. Okay. All right. um, so okay. this is this particular story. I'll just summarize is Stephanie's story and. Um, she was a woman who suffered from opioid use and she essentially was scared to seek medical care um, because during her drug use, whenever she would go to an urgent care or an emergency room, um, you know, she would be told right off the bat, like, we're not going to give you any drugs if that's what you're here for. Um, even if she was going because of, you know, a respiratory illness or, or something unrelated to her drug use. And it really... Um, affected how, she, how and when she sought care um, and um, likely extended the, uh, the length of the time that she used before she was able to enter recovery um, and recover. So I think that it's a, it's a good story. It, it, it likely um, would have hit home for, for many of you. I do encourage you to watch that link that Joe's gonna send out. Um, and over the next hour and a half, we're gonna be digging into some societal questions um, how all of us come to these concepts, these statistics, and these strategies um, is going to be different uh, because all of us have different starting points. We come from different places. We're all shaped by our own journeys. Your prior experiences will influence how you hear, process, and hopefully apply what you learn today um, to your own nursing practice. Next slide. So you are receiving um, continuing education credit for this. So specifically, we're gonna be explaining the differences between substance use and substance use disorder. We are, uh, you'll be able to articulate the effect of person-centered language on the care of patients who use drugs. And hopefully you'll be able to evaluate some harm reduction interventions for patients who use drugs and incorporate knowledge of them into your practice. But really, we're going to do so much more uh, than this. And I'm really glad that all of you have joined us. Next slide. So first, uh, let's start with the definition. What is harm reduction? Harm reduction is a set of practical strategies and ideas aimed at reducing the negative consequences associated with drug use. It's a movement for social justice built on the belief in and respect for the rights of all people, including people who use drugs. I think we can all agree that drug use is a part of our world. Uh, people who use drugs or mind altering substances, some of which are not legal or barely legal and others are totally legal, uh, is a part of our world. Drug use is a very complex continuum from severe, which is what comes to most of our minds, all the way down to abstinence. And there's a lot of different stops in between. People who use drugs still have healthcare needs um, and there are still opportunities for them to make healthier choices every day, even if it's not the choice to stop using drugs. In other words, just because someone uses drugs doesn't mean that they deserve to be homeless or to be denied adequate health care, or uh, to, the, to the extreme to die. Listen to this, over 20 million people use drugs and less than 10% of them receive any treatment. We're gonna get into what is defined as substance use disorder in a little bit and why treatment is so elusive for so many individuals. Harm reduction is also giving and maintaining recovery capital. So what is that? Um, recovery capital or capital in general is what you have going for you. It's the tools that you have in your toolbox. A good analogy is that if you have a house to renovate, 
You may not be a plumber or an electrician, but I bet that you can do some demo. I bet you can paint. And so those are the things that you bring to your project. That's your capital. In the nursing world, if I'm a registered nurse that I, that's floated to a different unit, I may not be an expert at X, but I have a solid foundation in Y. And so that's where I start. Um, and that's what I bring to my nursing team. For people who use drugs, capital may be that they are have a lovely relative or a trade that can help them earn money. It may have that they, uh, it may be that they have stable housing. It's whatever the good things are that they can draw strength from uh, so that they can continue to improve. Lastly, harm reduction is addressing the underlying issues driving substance use disorder. If 20 million people are using drugs, why is that? It's likely fulfilling some sort of need of some kind. And we're gonna talk about this underlying issue problem uh, today as well. Next slide. So now that we know that harm reduction is, let's talk about what it isn't. Uh, harm reduction is not enabling. Um, it's not saying that drug use is great um, or drawing on the positives of drug use. But on the other hand of the spectrum, it's also not an abstinence only take. We've seen throughout history how well abstinence only works, abolition, sex education, one choice usually doesn't work for everyone. And there's also implied judgment in abstinence only that shuts down any opportunity uh, for growth and improvement. Harm reduction also does not assume that all substance use is problematic. And this is a big one. Does the mom who of three who smokes weed two nights a week after the kids go to bed have a drug problem? How about the person who takes an out of van that's not necessarily theirs before getting on an airplane. Technically, these people are using drugs, but I would venture to say that they don't have a disorder or a substance use problem. So it's kind of keeping um, that in perspective. And lastly, harm reduction is not a one-sided decision um, of what is best for the patient. It's not prescriptive. And when done right, harm reduction is one of the best examples of true shared decision-making between a provider and a patient that I have ever experienced. It is a patient being honest about what will work for them and a provider listening and adjusting course to ensure small, then medium, then big wins over time. It's figuring out with your patient what their goal is and helping them to break down that goal into steps. Those steps are manageable it can be put into a plan. That plan with some assistance and some trust ends up becoming a reality. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about substance use in society in general and its prevalence. Many of us tend to take a zero tolerance stance on drug use, but there's a variety of drugs different frequencies and amounts of intake that come into play here. Um, on your screen, these are all drugs or mind altering substances uh, that are used in our society. Of these, uh, which do you partake in daily or weekly or monthly, or maybe even once a year? Next slide. Keeping that in mind, I'm going to go through a couple of scenarios for you to think about. Um, this is the first one. A person is taking a plane trip. They're terrified of flying. He takes some of his friend's prescription Xanax before getting on the plane, and he stays calm throughout the flight. The medication has worn off by the time they land. Is that a, a drug user? Next slide. How about this one? A couple finally has a night away from their kids who are safe and sound with their grandparents. They've been invited to a party. Someone brings cocaine. They each have a lime. They have a great night. They sleep over and they return home the next day and resume their parental responsibilities. Next slide. How about uh, this one? 
you have a person with a very stressful job who comes home each evening, has three gin and tonics. It's been the routine for quite some time. It helps them unwind. And afterwards, he helps put the kids to bed, reads, is asleep by 10 because the alarm clock's going to go off at 5 a.m. the next day. Um, I feel like uh, many of our, our patients have that as, uh, as their routine at times. But technically, that's three drinks a night. That's 21 drinks a week. Um, in nursing terms, that makes someone susceptible to the DTs. Something to think about. Now, there's one more I like to go over, and it's my own personal story. I don't think we have a slide for this one, Joe. Um, but it's a 34-year-old. I'm not 34 anymore. Um, who injures herself while rock climbing. She lands awkwardly. Here's a snap. And once at home, a friend arrives and offers two Vicodin from their dental procedure a few months ago to hold her over until she seeks medical care the next day. Um, that was totally me. So I think all of these scenarios happen pretty regularly. They've likely happened to you, one of you, um, one of these scenarios to one of you. Um, it's all pretty common and in a zero tolerance, with a zero tolerance stance, all of those scenarios would be considered um, in an unacceptable. Next slide. The point of all of this is that all substances in certain contexts may be considered reasonable or acceptable or normal, depending on a whole host of factors. You can go to the next slide. So for nursing and anyone in healthcare, there needs to be a clear understanding that drug use is not synonymous with drug addiction or, uh, or a drug problem. Drug use or substance use is simply the use of a substance that doesn't reach the threshold of substance use disorder or addiction. Now the government considers all use of illegal substances to be misuse, but harm reductionists tend to reject this point of view. Now I want you to use your chat feature here to weigh in. I was asked this question uh, during a small group discussion back last winter. Um, and so I'd like to see what you think. Of all the people who use heroin, what percentage do you think are chemically addicted or have what you would consider a disorder? I want you to put your chat, your answer into the chat. Again, we're looking for a percentage of people who use heroin that you think meet the level of uh, addiction. I'll give you about 30 seconds to, to do this. It's ranging from 20 to 90, but it looks like it's hovering around 30 to 50. Oh, you guys are smarter than my, than I was. <laughs> I'll put it that way. Very good. So you can go to the next slide, Joe. In this graph, the large green box represents 100% of the people who use the substance that's noted here. And the orange bars represent the people who have uh, a disorder or an addiction per the definition that we discussed a moment or two ago. So most people who use drugs don't develop a problem or an addiction or a, or a dependence. And that's one of the reasons that a lot of people who use drugs don't seek treatment. Of those who do use drugs, the drug that's the highest, uh, that the highest amount of people become chemically addicted to is nicotine. I'm sure none of you are surprised by that. Followed of course by heroin, crack, cocaine um, and others. So to me, it's important to, to realize that knowledge that someone uses a drug, even with some regularity, doesn't tell us that that person is addicted. It doesn't even mean that that person has a drug problem. More than 75% of drug users, whether they use alcohol, prescription medications, or illegal drugs, don't have a diagnosable problem. Simply put, addiction is not measured simply by one's ingesting of a substance. Next slide. 
So where is the tipping point? Um, these are criteria for substance use disorder based on the DSM-5 criteria. Um, so pretty much the more of these things that you have, uh, the more of a disorder you have. Um, so I like to look at this list and think about where my relationship with caffeine stands. Um, and while I don't think my use is hazardous and I don't neglect any major roles, I certainly get withdrawal. I've used more and more over the last years in larger and larger amounts. It's really hard for me to go a morning without my caffeine. I certainly crave it. Um, so that's one, two, three, four. I've got four or five of these uh, on my list. Now you may think to yourself, caffeine, who cares about caffeine? Um, there's an interesting um, audio book that's available by a, a gentleman named Michael Pollan, P-O-L-L-A-N, that chronicles his withdrawal from caffeine. Um, and it's, um, it, it was serious. It was, uh, it was a serious problem for him. It's hysterical to listen to, uh, but either way, it's the real thing. It's no joke. So any mind altering substance, sugar, alcohol, caffeine, um, you know, and obviously the ones that we think of more when we think of drugs, um, you can certainly become um, addicted to, uh, have a disorder with. You can go to the next slide. So there is a huge range um, of substance use behaviors. They range from you know, recreational use, which is pretty mild, to kind of an unhealthy, regular, but subclinical use. And then you get into substance use disorder, which is you know, in that orange category. And within this section there, um, the symptoms are associated, fall into four major groupings. There's impaired control, social impairment, risky use, and then there's some pharmacological criteria, meaning tolerance, uh, withdrawal, those sorts of things. Addiction is at the very far end of the spectrum, and it's defined as severe substance use disorder with neurobiological changes. Next slide. So why does all of this matter to us as nurses? Whoop, make all the things spin, nice job. Now that we have a foundation for what harm reduction is, what substance use and drug use versus misuse is, let's consider how the role of the clinical nurse is affected uh, by this information. Uh, what you have here is the American Nurses Association's provision one in their code of ethics. The nurse practices with compassion and respect for the inherent dignity, worth, and unique attributes of every person. So as nurses, we must set aside our biases and prejudice. Many of us feel uncomfortable when managing the care of persons who use drugs because their behavior may not be aligned with our value systems. But either way, whether a person fits within our own personal ethical framework or not, we must take actions to promote health and wellness, to address medical problems, and to respect our patients' decisions. This is each person's right to self-determination. This may mean choosing not to abstain from drugs for some, for some people, which means that the nurse's focus then needs to pivot to that of a harm reduction stance. This is what we mean when we talk about meeting someone where they are and identifying ways that we can help them to improve where they can, given perhaps their current need to continue to use. We don't have to agree with it, but we need to be able to support the whole person. One's worth shouldn't be affected by their drug use, and sometimes the smallest step in the right direction ends up being the biggest step of someone's life. If we have the opportunity, we should help people to take that first step. Next slide. As registered nurses, we are in a key position to help people who use drugs, whether wherever they are on that spectrum. Um, that way they can find their way to recovery or to harm reduction efforts. Um, can you click once, Joe? Uh, okay, click back. So point one here is that nurses are rated uh, the most trusted profession among Americans for 18 years in a row. 
that should never ever be taken lightly or for granted. We have people in our place of work where we frequently visit, in our neighborhood that confide in us, who ask us questions, who seek our guidance. People also see us as a trusted source of knowledge and resources. So it only makes sense that no matter what specialty of nursing we currently practice in, that we are aware of current harm reduction tactics and routes to recovery, that we actively listen to our patients' concerns and that we help direct them appropriately. In my spouse's line of work, this is called wayfinding. We as nurses are wayfinders for people for all sorts of medical conditions and substance use disorder or opioid use disorder is a medical condition. Within our own work environment, we interact with patients, with our words, our body language and our actions. We must make sure that we communicate in ways that are non-biased and we need to advocate for the best care possible and educate our colleagues and collaborators about what we know and about what we recommend for our patients. There is a large knowledge deficit when it comes to this information. And so now that you're, you have this information, it's your duty to use it. I came across a quote some time ago that I feel resonates with nursing. Be a lamp or a lifeboat or a ladder. Help someone heal. Walk out of your house each day like a shepherd. I think that's what all nurses do every day. Next slide. So all that's really easy, right? Nope. Nursing is an easy work and persons who use drugs aren't really an easy group sometimes to work with. Burnout is real in general terms and with nurses and other clinical staff who work with this population regularly. <coughs> Excuse me. The average work load of registered nurses expected to manage is usually pretty intense. It obviously varies from setting to setting, but as one colleague in a different field told me, nurses don't get paid to sit around and ponder things or to learn about the deep societal history of every patient that they care for. Nurses are experts at fixing things. So most of us as nurses do not have the time to learn the full story, to research every tidbit fully. Um, of any of the people that we care for. We hear in snippets about the reasons for drug use, not fully understanding a, a person's whole picture. A lab result here, a vague statement and report there, a slew of repeat visits, what seems like a very large tolerance. As I mentioned, nurses are exceptional at fixing things and we wanna do it quickly. We care for people in four, eight, 10 or 12 hour shifts in different locations at various points in someone's journey. Any one nurse caring for any one patient does not have time to fix that person's drug use disorder. Not in the same way we can provide pre-op instructions or solve heartburn, insert an IV and give fluids or ensure a safe chemotherapy infusion. Another reason for burnout in particular when we think about these patients is because we often see the end result of opioid use when it's at its ugliest. A cellulitis, a burn, an overdose, withdrawal, anger, pain, bitterness. We see the person with very little left, with no friends or family to call for a ride home from the hospital. We're there when the police arrive. We get the evasive answers. I liken it to the nurse or social worker who is entrenched with a particular population with a particular illness. The oncology nurse who cares for the sickest cancer patients or the social worker in the ER who sees the sickest of all uh, of the kids, for example. This submersion can skew our reality and make the, the rare seem like it's highly prevalent. If you're working in an ER or a trauma ICU or on a mental health floor, or in an urgent care, you likely see the underbelly all the time. One winter I had a patient that I took care of as a med surge nurse on a surgical floor. It was a girl, she was 16, and she was diagnosed with familial polyposis, uh, which is an, is an inherited trait where you get polyps throughout your intestines. It's got a high, high, high prevalence of cancer and she had had an endoscopy very rapidly, it was determined that she needed um, an ostomy. 
I cared for her for 36 hours, three 12 hour night shifts in a row, right after her ostomy procedure. I helped her through grief and her fear and her pain. I saw her regress. I coached her family through how to help her and not enable her. I said goodbye. I wished her well on my last morning. And then I was off for four days. And when I came back, she was gone. I think this experience is pretty common. We take care of people, we form attachments, but then we never really hear the, the end. We never know what happened next. I got an email from her about six months later. It was the end of the summer and she was about to go back in for her ileostomy reversal. She had made it through the summer. Thank goodness for Prince's teas, she said. And she thanked me for my time and my advice and my caring and my teaching. And I remember the way that email made me feel. I, I, I still have it. This closure is what sustains nurses. It fills us with purpose, but it's so rare, especially with people who use drugs or suffer from this sort of disorder. <clears throat> Next slide. This can lead to emotional distress when we don't think that what we do matters. This emotional distress uh, is something that we experience and we're expected to consume. And then at the end of our shift, we are supposed to go home and make dinner and get the kids on the bus or go volunteer. And we develop coping skills, ways to shield ourselves so that we can function. We depersonalize, we begin to generalize all people as a group, and then to not get too close or too hopeful. We only try half as hard because the likelihood that it will fix anything is small. And that, of course, is a self-fulfilling prophecy for our patients. It's a cycle. That's what often burns us out. It's not the hard work. Nurses work hard, but rather the feeling that our hard work doesn't matter. So what can we do about it? I think it's important that nurses know the signs of burnout, chronic fatigue, anger, self-criticism, suspiciousness, feeling helpless or irritable, increasingly taking risks both at work in your nursing practice and in your personal life. If you as a nurse have these signs, it's important that you address them and not avoid them. Don't think that they're normal or expected. Everyone has a bad day, but if this is where you live day in and day out, then you owe it to yourself to dig deeper and figure out what's happening. It's important that we seek professional help. There are counselors and social workers who have graduate level degrees and they can help us work through these feelings and develop new coping mechanisms and new plans. Self-care is a bit of a, a buzzword right now, uh, but it's not super easy in the world that we live in. Self-care isn't going to the spa or getting a mani-pedi. It involves daily and weekly rituals that keep your mind and your body energized and balanced. Even if you have an incredibly stressful job, be sure that you're squeezing enjoyment out of your non-work-related life. Time doing a hobby or exercising or reading and really stop and understand and have gratitude for those moments. Find something that brings you joy or comfort or fulfillment. Sing, volunteer, run, quilt, bake. It's important that you get plenty of sleep and that you're conscious of your diet decisions. Diet isn't just your food. Also be mindful of what you read, listen to, and what you watch because all of that is what you're consuming as well. And if you can, surround yourself with supportive people. It's also important that we tackle any personal trauma that we've had. <clears throat> We're gonna talk about trauma for persons who use drugs more in a minute, but <clears throat> as nurses, we need to acknowledge that there are certain patients or maybe certain behaviors, treatments, or situations that are going to hit close to home for us and raise past memories and emotions that are, that are traumatic for us. If we don't understand what those moments and those patients are, then we're going to transfer our anxiety and experience onto someone that may not deserve it. 
this could be related to drug use or any other number of experiences that we have as humans. My second child was born still at eight months. That sort of sudden, unexpected, and terrifying loss, followed by labor, delivery, and then leaving without my baby was traumatic. And for the next year, as I mourned, healed, and then re-entered my work life, pregnant people were my trigger. It didn't mean that I could avoid them, especially since at a certain point, I was one of them. But it did mean that I needed to do a self-check whenever I was caring for or even talking to a pregnant person or when I was asked about my own pregnancies and children. I needed to acknowledge for myself that the rise in my blood pressure and heart rate, that sudden pit in my stomach that I felt, it wasn't about the person I was talking to. It was about me and that that was okay, but also that my experience wasn't going to be their experience. If you never heal from what hurt you, you're going to bleed on people who didn't cut you. Next slide. So as nurses, how do we actually employ harm reduction techniques? These three elements are going to come up next. Non-judgmental person-centered language. Why should we and how do we shift to non-judgmental behavior and language in order to reduce stigma and be more person-centered? We're also going to talk about uh, healing versus paternalism. Why should we and how do we move away from paternalistic care planning to holistic care pathways? And lastly, reframing how we measure improvement. Why should we and how should we measure success through this new harm reduction lens where abstinence isn't the only positive outcome, but quality of life and healthier uh, choices are also considered, uh, considered to be improvements. Next slide. First, non-judgmental. When you encounter a person who uses or has used drugs, consider these underpinnings. It's not always aligned with the data, but it is much of the time. First, there's, there's life circumstances. This person that you're caring for may be experiencing physical, emotional, or sexual trauma. They may be experiencing poverty or a recent job loss or personal loss, and their drug use may be fulfilling a need for them to cope with these life circumstances. Right or wrong, it may be what the drug use is doing for them. Health is another important factor when caring for these persons. Physical injury, when combined with mental illness like depression, bipolar, or a predisposition to addiction increases one's risk for drug use exponentially. Also, I like to point out at this point that we all know that through the late 90s and early 2000s, any pain or injury was treated with opioids, which were heavily marketed and risks were minim minimized. We as nurses, as, as doctors, as healthcare institutions were graded uh, based on how well we controlled a person's pain. Remember, pain is whatever the patient says it is, and pain, the fifth vital sign. Imagine having a serious injury in the 90s or early 2000s. The deck was a bit stacked against you. There's a great podcast episode. Um, there's actually two of them um, that chronicles the economics of opioid use um, and the effect it had on the healthcare system and on patients. Uh, the podcast is called Freakonomics. Uh, it begins with F, Freak, Freakonomics. Um, and it's episode 402 and 403. If this is an interesting topic for you and you want to learn more, um, they're, they're excellent, excellent podcasts. You can go to the next slide, Joe. So the last thing uh, that's really important to keep in mind is adverse childhood experiences. When you're caring for a person who uses drugs, there's a pretty good chance that, again, the deck was a bit stacked. Adverse childhood experiences um, have been studied heavily over the last five to 10 years with some emerging evidence. 
people who were exposed as children to neglect, poverty, violence upon them, their family members in any form, kids who experienced divorce, divorce or incarcerated parents, this all leads to a cascade of events um, that ultimately leads nowhere good. Exposure to these events, researchers have found, disrupts the fundamental way uh, that one's neurodevelopment occurs, the way that their wiring happens. And this stunts their emotional, social, and cognitive function, which leads to suboptimal, often short-sighted decision-making. That can lead to poor health decisions, risky behaviors, poor economic decisions. All of these things, as we know, can lead to early acquisition of chronic health conditions, poverty, early death, um, substance use. And while 67% of all people have one adverse childhood event. As you can see, many of these likely come in bundles. Poverty leads to abuse or neglect, exacerbated by mental illness. And if you have four or more of these, you are 11 times more likely to use opioids, specifically IV drugs. These are kids, right? We're not talking about grownups. These are kids predetermined by their socioeconomic and familial upbringing to have things like drug use, heart problems, diabetes, asthma. It's fascinating, but also when you think about it, it's not very surprising. Next slide. So how our current model of care for drug use or misuse treatment uh, is built is a little bit flawed. One must keep an appointment or future treatments will be withheld. I want you to find me one other disease where this makes sense, where we accept this as the appropriate approach. Ironically, I dealt with this with a doctor um, many, many years ago when I was diagnosed with a thyroid disorder. The physician that I initially was paired with had extremely strict rules regarding how he prescribed thyroid medication. Very, you know, very scandalous stuff, that thyroid medication. I had to come into the office every three months to physically pick up a paper prescription. They wouldn't call it in, they wouldn't mail it to me, they wouldn't fax it. And if I didn't comply, then they wouldn't fill my prescription. It was nuts. They would withhold my meds. And as a nurse working five days a week, I couldn't often get in before that five o'clock deadline when their office shut. I couldn't meet this doctor's strict requirements. If opioid use disorder is a diagnosed disease, then why would we treat them in the same way without becoming equally enraged? In the harm reduction model, in what we hope to be future models, treatment that doesn't mandate frequent appointments will be possible. That way we're working with people to find a balance that benefits their likelihood of maintaining progress while still reducing any barriers to their success. Sometimes in the current way that we do things, a patient must participate in X because X works for everyone. 90 days of group meetings or, or 90 group meetings in 90 days, for example, even when that approach is exceedingly difficult to manage, if someone has transportation issues or a job to hold down or prescribing that someone join a 12-step program that's heavily reliant on faith or religion, even when a person doesn't have um, a lot of faith. Again, apply this to any other field of medicine and it just doesn't make sense. Take diabetes. If a patient states in a visit with you that they can't manage to check their blood sugar four times a day because it hurts too much, because the test strips are too expensive, we generally educate about the importance, advocate for a reduction in cost, adjust the care plan to meet the patient's needs. And if they still can't tolerate or afford one treatment, we work to change it to a less expensive or a better tolerated treatment. The other thing that we strive to do with patients with a new diagnosis is to educate thoroughly about what's happening, why it's happening, to provide a rationale behind the various options for treatment. When you think about a, a cancer diagnosis, a diagnosis <clears throat> there's so much education that goes into this. In the traditional paternalistic paradigm used with drug use treatment, 
It is often prescribed without options, abstinence only, attend a meeting a day, see me once a week, get tested two times a week. Patients, all patients, tend to do better when they understand what's happening, <clears throat> when they understand why certain treatments are recommended, and if they don't have the ability to participate fully in one option, having another option available. I think this is my last podcast reference for this, uh, for this webinar. Um, it's called Healthcare Workers in Recovery. Um, and it's in one episode, the absurdity of treatment regimens is illustrated by a registered nurse who has opioid use disorder. Um, again, worth the listen, in my opinion, if this um, topic interests you. When a patient fails to complete a treatment, any patient, not just a, a patient with drug use, as a nurse, it's very easy for me to be upset with my patient, not outwardly, of course, but, but internally. But in reflection, if I set a goal for my patient that wasn't ever attainable for them in the first place, and they didn't reach the, that goal, is that their fault? It's all about circling back, resetting priorities, finding ways, small steps to be safer, to set goals that are achievable. Next slide. So what is recovery? Um, this is where we're gonna get into reframing some metrics. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA, has the following working definition of recovery. It is a return to physical health, financial stability, and meaningful social connections. If we use that as our definition for recovery, then any movement towards stable health, home, purpose, community, or relationship is a move towards recovery. And so the best way to do this is to ensure that our goals are set by and with the patient. As we've already talked about, this is tough for many nursing specialties because we're so used to defining our goals for our patients. You know, for that knee replacement patient, our goal is for you to have flexion to 80 degrees within one week. Or in acute care, the nurse has more control over someone's, you know, successful attainment of a blood sugar. Especially on the inpatient side of things, this is all managed by checking the blood sugar, ordering a specific diet, ensuring adequate insulin and other meds. It's all very easy to control. But when you think about this with other chronic conditions, and substance use disorder is a chronic health condition, the nurse loses a bit of control over the success and has to give some control back to the patient and find ways to help that patient achieve those goals, even when circumstances aren't ideal. If you ostracize your patient, either overtly through your words or through your body language, implying that they aren't successful and won't be until they're abstinent, do you think that that person will come back to you if they fail to meet your expectations? Would you go back? Or would you be more apt to come back if there was positive feedback about progress made with encouragement and support and a genuine desire to build trust? As a nurse in any role who is caring for a patient who uses drugs, it's important to celebrate any success and to understand that the ultimate goal of harm reduction which is that the patient continues to return to where they're receiving treatment is the most important thing to maintain and that the patient has an increased quality of life if they keep coming back. Next slide. So our language is important, um, both in our documentation and in how we talk with our patients and our colleagues and our care partners. Um, this is a study that was done um, recently. Uh, the study had two groups. In one group, uh, a group of providers, nurses, physicians, was provided a scenario, a summary of a patient, and the patient was referred to as a substance abuser. And in the other group, the person was referred to as having substance use disorder. This observed, during the study, it was observed, uh, it observed different impressions that providers had about patients based on this one change um, in, in how the patient was described. 
It demonstrated that our words, both documented and verbalized, influenced our action planning for patients. So for example, in one group, the substance abuser um, was more culpable and uh, the group felt that punitive measures should be taken with that person when compared to the person with substance use disorder. The, per the substance abuser was less likely to maintain um, compliance with treatment. Um, that person was also likely to be uh, perceived as more socially threatening and was often blamed for their substance use. Um, and it was felt that they had more control over their substance use when compared to the person who had a substance use disorder. So what additional language can impact our clinical care? I want you to think about this scenario. Next slide. Mrs. J. She is a 44-year-old female with a long history of polysubstance abuse with poor compliance with outpatient treatment and little insight into her addiction. She presents complaining of pain and swelling in her right lower extremity. She also has a history of drug seeking behavior. And I suspect that her homelessness and this is a primary reason for her visit, i.e. secondary gain. Quite charged. Um, I think we can all understand what's wrong with this. Uh, but just to go through some of the things that are, 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 are clearly jaded here. Um, you know, non-compliance in particular implies that a patient could resolve any barriers to care through his or her own actions. And it doesn't acknowledge that there might be some structural barriers that are keeping someone from completing therapy. Little insight is also really interesting to me because it assumes that someone doesn't understand um, how their drug use is impacting their health. Um, which a lot of times people who use drugs do understand that they're just not at a point where they can overcome, uh, overcome their drug use yet. Drug seeking behavior implies that there's no physiological need for pain management for this patient when perhaps this person did injure their leg. Homeless person is another thing that I still catch myself saying, you know, this, you know, that person is homeless, this person is homeless but calling someone homeless implies that the patient's identity is first and foremost wrapped up in their housing status. Um, so it's important that we try and rethink how we state things like that, housing insecurity, um, you know, in between, um, you know, tenuous living situation. There are other ways that we can communicate that. And then secondary gain. This implies that the patient is faking rather than navigating a broken system the best that they can. I'm gonna show you an alternative. Oh, these are all the wrong things. You can go one more slide. How about this one? How's this sound? Mrs. J is a 44 year old female with a past medical history of substance use who presents with pain and swelling to her right lower extremity following a fall down three stairs. X-ray demonstrates no fracture but significant soft tissue damage and sprain. Prior to the visit, she had previously been lost to follow-up in an outpatient treatment, possibly due to housing insecurity. I will refer her to case manager for assistance. So again, this one is, is, is clearly more objective. Um, I also like that this one addresses why the person has leg pain. I think that was clearly missing in the first example. Um, and if you want to look at this from a medical legal standpoint, in this particular example, the provider is, is, is making a case and, and looking at the, the physiological reasons why this person is presenting and not just looking back at, at prior reasons that the patient maybe had been through this clinic or this urgent care or this setting. This example does still acknowledge the history of substance use, but it doesn't have quite as much drama <laughs> Um, and again, the reason for the visit is clear and the housing status is addressed here, not in a way that is shameful, but in a way that this person may need help from a case manager. So we're going to provide that help. Next slide. So elaborating a bit on this kind of way that we use words to describe things, um, I want you to consider how you use 
these words in your documentation, in your report to your, uh, to your colleagues in discussions uh, with providers. In particular, words like habit, abuse, problem, these are all very negative. Uh, they have very negative connotations. Words like disorder, misuse are more objective and non-biased. Clean versus dirty is also one to, to consider when you're talking about a person or when you're talking about a, a, a urine or a drug tox test. Positive versus negative is better when you're talking about any test. In recovery is a better way to discuss someone's drug use status. Um, relapse also holds a connotation of failure. Recurrence isn't quite as charged. And then replacement therapy or substitution therapy um, versus just treatment or medication for substance use disorder. We don't ever talk about insulin as a replacement therapy or Synthroid as a replacement therapy. So if we're gonna treat drug use disorder as a medical problem, then the treatment would just be the treatment, not a replacement treatment. Again, implying that this step towards recovery, a return to physical health, financial stability, meaningful social connections is good, and it's not just a replacement. This pledge, by the way, can be found if you Google the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, or if you Google Recover Hope Campaign. Um, it is, it has a place at the bottom where you can have um, your colleagues sign it, uh, review it and sign it. Um, and so I would encourage you to take a peek through that, uh, that really great resource online. The other nice thing about this sort of thing, our change in language, is that it costs zero dollars, zero healthcare dollars go into how we, the words that we use. And it can actually have a pretty dramatic impact on this marginalized group's perception of and trust in a healthcare system uh, that they need. Next slide. Uh, so next we're gonna get into harm reduction interventions. These are some of the harm reduction interventions or tactics that are currently available. Um, and all of these things help to reduce risk uh, to gain health and ultimately to not die or overdose from drug use. Um, these tactics reduce harm often in a gradual way based on where a patient is in their recovery journey. Next slide. So if we don't want people to die, then arming them with Narcan is a pretty important tactic. Um, there are programs and places to obtain Narcan across the state of Rhode Island um, there's an injectable and also an intranasal formula for this. Um, Narcan or naloxone knocks the opioids off of the receptors, which brings the patient's intoxication down very rapidly. And it restores the respiratory drive, which is often what causes an overdose or what causes someone to die from an overdose. Studies have found that communities that widely distribute Narcan and have Narcan administration education programs have lower mortality rates from opioid overdose than those who do not have similar programs. I like to think about the number of nurses that are in Rhode Island. There's something like 25,000 nurses in Rhode Island. Imagine what we could do if all of us kept Narcan in the same way we kept a CPR mask in our glove box. Um, what the impact that might have um, on our communities. Just an interesting thought. Next slide. So syringe exchanges also um, are a harm reduction technique or tactic. This reduces the risk of hepatitis, HIV, and also things like basic cellulitis and skin breakdown. Um, studies have found that a syringe exchange program is worth the investment as treatment for hepatitis and HIV is exceedingly expensive. Essentially, $6 are saved for every $1 spent on a syringe exchange program. Also, it's important to note that there have been no documented increase use of IV drugs with the initiation of syringe exchange programs in communities. And to the contrary, there have been increased enrollment in substance use treatment programs by those who participate in needle exchange programs. 
Why might this be? If a person is coming in for a new syringes, I think that it means that they're taking some self-care steps. It means that they see a future, that they care about their health. And coming into that place where they get new syringes allows them to build trust with personnel um, at that place. And that can lead to further harm reduction efforts and recovery steps when the time is right. Next slide. There are lots of different places uh, around Rhode Island uh, where syringe exchanges are happening. AIDS Care Ocean State has a needle exchange location in Providence and also some mobile outreach uh, vans that are in Pawtucket, Woonsocket, and Newport. Project Weber Renew is on Broad Street in Providence and they also have mobile outreach in Pawtucket and Providence. And there's a location in Woonsocket called the Serenity Center, which provides free needles, syringe, Narcan, fentanyl test strips, all sorts of different harm reduction um, tools, equipment uh, for persons who use drugs. Next slide. So fent fentanyl test strips are another, um, use of fentanyl test strips is another tactic. Um, interestingly, Rhode Island, our little bitty state is a bit of a hub for drug trafficking. Um, it's small, it's easy to get from one side of the state to the other. And for this reason, um, the Fusion Center in Rhode Island, which monitors and analyzes drug trafficking in and through the state, has found that in Rhode Island, essentially 100% of the heroin, cocaine, and pills are laced with fentanyl. Test strips help someone to better understand what it is that they're about to take. And that in and of itself, that knowledge can lead to behaviors that are on the spectrum of harm reduction. Things like using more slowly or using with friends instead of in isolation, um, switching buyers or possibly not using from a particular supply. Next slide. So also safer injection practices um, or teaching safer injection practices is another tactic of harm reductionists. The Harm Reduction Coalition has a safety manual for injection drug users that can be found at the website that's at the bottom of, your, of the screen here. Um, and this education is all about helping individuals who use drugs understand the importance of clean techniques, of selecting safe places, of using clean equipment. Nurses aren't doing much of this sort of education, but there are caseworkers at many organizations in our state who, for persons who are still using drugs, will counsel them on how to improve their safety while using drugs. And these tactics help to re reduce infection that's associated with emergency room visits. And as I mentioned with the needle exchange programs, if a person is willing to take these steps, then they may in time feel comfortable and ready to seek further recovery. Next slide. So overdose prevention centers or OPCs are supervised injection sites that are um, seen as an additional tactic um, for harm reduction. This has been embraced, this concept has been embraced in other countries but I don't believe that there are any, or there might only be one or two that are um, in the United States. These sites are staffed with peer recovery personnel, with medical personnel, with caseworkers who can meet with people who are struggling with housing, food security, or looking to begin their recovery. But there are also sites where folks can safely test their product and use under the supervision of, of medical staff. Having all these resources, essentially any resource along the spectrum of harm reduction in one place, while still ensuring safer use, helps people develop trust among a team of providers. And then when they're ready, they can enter recovery at their pace. So how do we integrate all of this into practice? Next slide. 
first, it's important that we are compassionate. Um, can you click once, Joe? Okay. All right, go back one. I had another little, the little things are supposed to move, but it's not working. That's okay. Um, so we need to consider the individual, where they are in their recovery and what they're requesting at the time that you are meeting with them. And you need to deliver your care in whatever setting with compassion and with the expectation that armed with information and resources, people are gonna make choices that are right for them in that moment. We also need to be aware of, of evidence, this evidence of harm reduction theory. Like any other aspect of nursing, we need to advocate for interventions that are evidence-based and these tactics that we've discussed today have been vetted and are well documented as successful ways to improve health and encourage recovery from drug use. And lastly, we need to operate under the assumption that all persons coming into our orbit are worthy of our efforts. We need to encourage, uh, we need to ensure rather that the language that we use and the behaviors that we demonstrate are not ostracizing or stigmatizing. This first and foremost is our ethical duty as registered nurses. Next slide. So we can't have a conference without talking about COVID-19 um, and how it has affected everything. Um, and persons with opioid use disorder or persons who use drugs have had to, like all of us, figure out how to access and sustain their recovery with out some of the community that for many aids in one's recovery, meetings, peer support, visits with a counselor, et cetera. Many peer recovery groups have migrated to online, which for some has actually brought more people into treatment, but for others, it's a barrier to access. Treatment protocols, things like use of, of, of Suboxone and Methadone, generally come with strict visitation requirements. You, know, you have to come in daily for your medication or weekly for your medication to a clinic for check-ins and testing. But during COVID-19, during the lockdown, there was a loosening of this restriction. And that reduced the exposure of persons seeking treatment and also the people providing it. It is dependent on access to a phone which, believe it or not, is not something that all people have, especially if they don't currently have a job or a secure place to live. Thankfully, there are outreach workers who have been providing mobile phones to persons who need access to their, uh, to their drug treatment, to their Suboxone or their Methadone. And that way they can complete a telephonic visit and maintain access to their line of, of, of treatment. One of the harm reduction tactics used is stressing the importance of using in groups. I'm sure you heard me say that a, a couple of times. And if a problem occurs, to call 911 and get to the hospital. All of that, of course, changed when we locked down and when people were asked not to gather and when hospitals were the ground zero for COVID-19. It became the last option and there was hesitation um, among people who use drugs to, to call or to bring friends in, and that had serious consequences. Next slide. In particular for nurses in emergency rooms, the increased risk of exposure to COVID-19 by patients of unknown status has changed the level of care we provide until we get that rapid result back. With each patient interaction comes the concern over, was I exposed? And during Rhode Island's initial peak in April and May, changes to policy to protect the front lines changed how quickly nurses or other medical personnel could initiate life-saving procedures. And the mere donning and doffing of appropriate PPE for someone of unknown status increased the amount of time between a code blue situation and the care that reverses it. There was also a reduction in ER visits by those that had overdosed, but there was also an increase in opioid related deaths. Um, I heard last week on NPR that uh, 
opioid overdoses rose by about 30 percent um, in the last dur during the COVID-19 crisis so far. For frontline nurses, this was a, a substitution really of one pandemic for another, but it wasn't really. It's just that one pandemic took the forefront and the other was happening outside of uh, the walls of our emergency rooms and urgent care centers. Through conversations with state police, hospital and outpatient treatment leadership, and those that monitor our state's incoming data, opioid overdoses were on the rise the month prior to COVID-19 lockdown. And as I just mentioned, uh, we're beginning to, to see the data that happened over the summer and opioid deaths did rise pretty dramatically. It's been difficult though to analyze due to the complex circumstances of the spring and summer. ER visits were down, opioid deaths were up, but the people involved in the data gathering and analysis aren't sure why that was. Was it a delay in calls for help? Was it a delay in helping, in receiving help? Was it an incorrect cataloging of overdose related calls? There's just still a lot of unknowns. Our last video, which I hope will work, um, is Abby's story. And it's about Narcan and the role that we play in um, helping to prevent overdose. Every single community has been affected. Every demographic, every type of person, you know, men, women, young, old, black, white, doesn't matter. I am a, a contributing member of society today because naloxone was in the hands of a lay person. I had just experienced three overdoses a few months prior to that, and I was just hopeless. Scared, 22, no clue how to live my life. All I had really done up to that point was use drugs and find ways and means to get more. Little did I know, just the, on the other side of that door was an entire community wanting to help me. Our community has shown up in a, a real way. I always say that we're a little state, but we do recovery in a big way. And that's the power of community. That's the power of sharing stories, is that we see ourselves in other people, and other people see themselves in us. What's more powerful than looking at someone in the eye and saying, you know, I understand, and me too. You know, those words, they are transformative. I believe that we need to recover out loud so people don't die alone in the dark. It's a public health crisis, and if you have the ability to save someone, then why wouldn't you? How many people are we missing if we don't share about it openly, if we don't speak out loud? And today, that's what my whole life is about, is sharing my story and empowering others to do the same. It's transformative. It's changed my life. I'm going to turn it over to Joe. We're going to be doing a, a breakout session. Um, and then we'll all come back together at the end and do a little bit of sharing before we wrap up. Mm -hmm.